Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this week, you are reading about the social and emotional development of children. And one of the themes that I've tried to be conveying over the course of this unit is the way in which certain skills and abilities become integrated within children and then affect their ability to engage with the world in more complicated and richer ways. Uh, and several of the topics in this week's readings uh, relate to that. For example, you'll see that play is in part an internal imagination-based experience, uh, cognitively very intuitive, very personal, and at the same time, by the end of the early childhood period, six years old, five and six, for example, children's play allows them to engage in more complicated activities that involve other children, playing different roles, and uh, this will be a stepping stone, as we'll see in the school age years, to being able to engage in objective games and organized kinds of play. I wanted to focus today, though, on uh, one kind of integration within the child that also becomes connected to their relationships around them. And that is the increasing development and emergence of a sense of self. Now, you might remember that early experiences of the self started to show up in children as young as uh, uh, 18 months to two years of age, a beginning of self-awareness. But the kinds of self-awareness between ages three and six are of a quite different kind and much more profound. For the ter first time, for example, young children develop self-concepts, that is, ideas about who they are, uh, ideas as a child, ideas in terms of gender development, ideas as a sibling, uh, ideas of what they're good at and what they're able to do. Secondly, uh, they begin to develop um, clear signs of self-esteem, that is, feelings of worth or value. Uh, as we saw earlier when we talked about parents and parental feedback, the way that parents interact with children, the messages that they give their kids, continue to form the basis of these internal representations that children begin to show. One of the interesting things, again, is that uh, very different from earlier in development, the kinds of self-concepts and self-esteem that children develop during this period are predictive, again, of future relationships. Uh, children with higher self-esteem at age five and six uh, frequently have higher self-esteem in the school age years and in adolescence. They're also better able to form and feel more positively about peer relationships later in childhood and adolescence. What you see in this stage is that the result of parental feedback and involvement in the lives of children translates into internal representations, inner working models, they're called, that children have of who they are, whether they're likable, what they're like. And so I wanted to spend a few minutes today talking with you about parenting styles and discipline. Uh, the subject of parenting styles and discipline has a rich history in psychology. Again, it goes back to early theoretical questions about how does personality emerge and just how important are parents to that. Uh, recent research suggests, of course, that as children get older, their personalities are more influenced by non-parental sources of feedback. Uh, teachers in school, for example, in elementary and uh, uh, secondary school and certainly peers and peer groups play an increasingly important part. However, the kinds of feelings that parents have towards their kids, how they express limits and boundaries that you see in the relationships of children to their parents during early childhood are fairly stable over time. Uh, Diana Bowman's work that forms the foundation of what you're reading is one of several different ways to look at parenting, but I think it's a, essentially a good place to start. And of course, she describes several different kinds of parenting styles, uh, authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, and what is sometimes called uninvolved parenting. The dimensions that these kinds of parenting differ on are twofold. One is in the degree of control and autonomy 
in the kinds of relationships of parents and children. Do parents make the, all the decisions? Do they tell children what to do? Do they expect children to listen and follow? Or are children given free reign to decide when they go to bed, what they eat, uh, what to watch on TV? Or some middle ground where parents set limits and boundaries but allow children to have some input into the decisions that are made for them and with them. Uh, the other dimension, so we have this one dimension, autonomy and control, and the other dimension is an emotional dimension. The degree of affection, uh, warmth uh, expressed by parents towards children, or the degree of distance or uh, disengagement, withholdingness, or outright hostility that can be conveyed. On that dimension, let me just say that regardless of the kind of parenting you're looking at, uh, children, uh, not just preschool age kids, but school age kids and adolescents and adults really seek and need uh, affection. They need to be listened to. They need to be cared about. Uh, they need to have a sense that they are important in the lives of their caregivers. And so regardless of the parenting style, parents who uh, are emotionally invested in their children and uh, tend to be fairly unconditional when it comes to their sense of affection, tend to have children who feel better about themselves. Now that doesn't mean that you let children do anything and everything that they want, but rather it's an emotional connection, a sense of we're on the same side, not against each other. At the other end of that spectrum, parents who are disengaged or uh, cold or hostile or critical uh, are likely to have children who will grow up with feelings of self-doubt and uh, feelings of um, inadequacy about what they're capable of and about who they are. What's interesting to many psychologists is how the sense of self that children develop between the ages of three and six becomes connected to and integrated with the kinds of style of discipline and parenting that parents convey. You don't yet at this age see that translated, as you will later, into the quality of peer relationships or in terms of academic performance. At this point, it's more taken inward. And in the next stage, we'll see it's carried outward in terms of how children uh, relate to others around them. Uh, Bomerind and others uh, argue that it's important when looking at parenting styles to look at the underlying assumptions that parents have about what it means to parent and what children are like. Uh, authoritarian parents, for example, who are marked by a lot of control, what we would call strict families with lots of rules, tend to believe that it's the parent's responsibility to set limits and rules for children and to tell children what they should do. They often feel very protective of their kids. Uh, they may have the opinion that children should be seen but not heard, that children uh, shouldn't have too much say in what they do because parents know best. Uh, and they may believe further that uh, uh, children periodically need to know who's the boss, who's in charge, and that parents have the responsibility to let their kids know that, particularly through the use of uh, punishment or spanking or some way in which the child is uh, focused and attentive to who's the boss. Um, interestingly, most psychologists uh, in this area would tell you that uh, spanking is not a particularly good idea, that uh, intimidation or physical punishment of children tends to have effects that you don't really want to um, uh, have on children. It may get them to follow rules, for example, but it doesn't teach them that much about why they are following that rule beyond the fact that uh, someone with more power is making them. And in fact, when you look at discipline, the kind of discipline often associated with authoritarian households is what's called power assertive discipline, where parents exert their power to make decisions and force behavior. Bowman and her colleagues tend to encourage and find most healthy what psychologists call the authoritative method of parenting. And that's one in which children uh, are given explanations for rules. They are uh, praised and encouraged and supported in their behavior. And uh, 
that punishment occurs very infrequently. Uh, their argument is that when you reward children for consequences or behavior that you wish to see, there's less likelihood that those same children will misbehave. And in fact, a lot of research bears them out. Children who are praised for the behavior that they're doing, that they're supposed to do, or who are encouraged to engage in quote unquote pro-social behavior, uh, tend in fact to misbehave a lot less and to receive a lot less negative attention. So um, rather than a power assertive kind of discipline, these parents, uh, authoritative parents, tend to use what psychologists call inductive techniques. Uh, to induct somebody means to enter them into the relationship, usually using praise and reward and encouragement as opposed to paying attention when a child misbehaves. One of the interesting things to think of as a parent or a person is, what do I mean by discipline? Do I think that discipline is what you do when a child misbehaves, or do I think that discipline is what you do when a child is behaving the way you want them to? Uh, see how you want to answer that question. One other thing about discipline and it, intervention. Another question to ask yourself is, do I use discipline to inhibit a behavior, or do I use discipline to redirect a behavior? Discipline that's meant to inhibit is essentially meant to stop something that's going on now without that much attention to replacing it with something else. Whereas discipline that's aimed at redirecting a behavior tends to offer an alternative or a direction that the child can go in. So again, ask yourself in terms of your views of discipline, how do you see it and when do you use it? Well, I'll go to the punchline and tell you that authoritative parenting styles seem to be the most effective at providing clear limits, number one, guidance and choice, and directing behavior in ways that can lead to better feelings about oneself and more positive self-concepts. A word about permissive and uninvolved parenting um, before I end today. Many permissive parents, again, are permissive because they believe in the value of uh, allowing children to be themselves, to do as they wish, uh, to uh, express themselves, if you will. In fact, as an American value, uh, this is a very common part of how we see growing up. That is, we tend to see growing up as a process of increasing self-expression and self-reliance. Uh, we promote individuality as a, uh, a goal of being mature. And many parents who are permissive are quite loving and caring of their kids, but their parenting is what might be called child-centered. That is, they let the child take the lead. Oh, what do I care if he has this for breakfast or that for breakfast? Or what do I care if he wants to wear these clothes or that clothes? Uh, the positive side of that, particularly when linked with affection, is that children often feel very uh, good about themselves. They can feel very um, uh, centered uh, in the family, that they're very important. But some of the unintended consequences are that children often have somewhat more difficulty setting their own limits and boundaries. And they, they may be more prone to, uh, if not tantrums, a, a demanding or stubbornness about them. Or in later relationships with other kids, studies suggest that uh, kids in permissive households have a bit more trouble getting along with other kids because they're not used to being flexible and negotiating. They're used to having their way, to speaking their mind. Uh, and so while we have a discipline style that promotes individuality, it may not help in the important ways that are necessary for people to get along with each other and uh, negotiate and take turns and share things. Uninvolved parenting, by contrast, usually involves some kind of failure on the part of parents to pay sufficient attention to their children and provide them with adequate feedback. At one point in the chapter that you're reading, you're reading, for example, about maltreatment of children. And certainly one kind of maltreatment of children is neglect. Now, there are a lot of reasons for neglect. In fact, many of them are understandable. Um, poverty, uh, economic instability, emotional insecurity. Uh, these kinds of things can um, produce a kind of inattentive or neglectful state. But uh, studies suggest that children really need to be recognized by their parents, number one, 
and number two, recognized in positive kinds of ways that validate who they are. And the children whose parents are disengaged or uninvolved or who don't seem to care tend to internalize in children a sense that perhaps it's not worth their being cared about. It diminishes their sense of self-concept and self-esteem. Now Erickson's way of talking about this, and the last thing I'm going to mention for today, is to describe it in terms of what he calls initiative versus guilt. Where a balance has to be made between allowing children to express initiative, that is purposeful behavior uh, that they take the lead in, without feeling undue guilt. Um, guilt is an interesting kind of emotion. It's uh, a feeling about oneself when one has broken some kind of rule or boundary, whether other people know that you have or not. Uh, lying would be an example. Uh, where others may not know if you have lied, but you know. Uh, children have to both be sensitive to the fact that uh, uh, they can control what other people know about them and what they do, and yet they have to be self-controlling, that is, maintain their behavior in socially appropriate boundaries and feel good about themselves. Now, a positive kind of guilt is, a, for example, a sense of initiative associated with feeling pride or feeling accomplishment or feeling good that you've done something. And in fact, uh, much of the conscience that gets developed in the preschool years is a positive kind of conscience, not a negative one. Erickson suggests that parents who use inhibitory discipline too much or are too strict may leave children feeling a sense of guilt about any kind of self-expression that children shouldn't ask questions or shouldn't be curious at a time when he thinks that curiosity is particularly important in the lives of children. On the other hand, children who are overly curious or don't have any boundaries may be intrusive or may uh, go into areas uh, that are a disregard of other people's uh, property or other people's rights. So again, many psychologists feel that that authoritative pattern in which parents provide firm boundaries and also encourage positive behavior allows for the best balance of curiosity and inquisitiveness and initiative on the one hand and a healthy sense of constraint and inhibition and guilt on the other. Well, uh, I'll leave you to read about these topics during this week, but uh, as you do, uh, I hope you'll come away with it with a better sense of how by the end of this period children have personalities. They have thoughts and feelings about themselves which are surprisingly stable over the course of the remainder of childhood. See you next week.